Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Coffee comes from a tree. It grows just like a cherry, only instead of eating the outside, you drink what comes out of the seed. This means that coffee is fruit juice that you drink hot. Uh, or maybe cold, since I've discovered Chick-fil-A has frosted coffee. Organic Man Coffee Trike still has the best coffee on the planet, and you can only get it by swinging by 4501 McPherson or OrganicManCoffeeTrike.shop if it's too far to drive. I was on Ghoul Radio 956 this week. It's a new show recorded here in Laredo. As soon as the show is out, I'll put a link on my page. I've been on four podcasts this month, aside from my own. No wonder I'm tired. How can talking into a microphone be so wearing? It's almost like I'm actually doing work or something. Annabelle Lee mentioned me at the ending of Trailer Trash Terrors. It's uh, good getting recognition from a creepy little girl. Vic Hermanson is trying to get to 100 shows, so he's doing two shows a week. Check it out. Trailer Trash Terrors with an S on the end. It's a good show. I enjoy listening to it. Uh, some of y'all might uh, decide you like him better than me, in which case... Uh, I'll get Annabelle Lee to come pay you a visit, if I can. A couple of weeks ago, I was on Big Dog's Random Show. I put a link on my Facebook page. It's out now if you want to check it out. And that was a little redundant. It's another paranormal show that uh, talks about strange things, only it's not called Strange Things. Big Dog's Random Show. With Halloween just around the corner, here are a few more scary things to keep in mind as you walk around in the dark or as you're laying there in bed trying to go to sleep. I don't speak Japanese, and a bunch of these names are in Japanese, so bear with me. I am going to do my best. Nakikubi are a vari variety of Rokarubi. Rokarubi are women who are transformed into monsters by a curse. Nikarubi are similar in most respects, except their head actually detaches completely from the body, thus becoming a headless, or rather a bodiless, entity. The head is able to fly around in search of its next victim. Because their heads detach, they can travel farther distances than the Rokarubi. Nukarubi are looking for their next meal that consists of blood. They're also considered to be more violent than Rokarubi. Their flying head sucks the blood out of victims like a vampire. There are no, no limits, and they will bite humans and animals to death. Like the Rokarubi, being a Nukarubi is considered a curse. Edo period scientists believed that the Nukarubi suffered from an infliction similar to somnambulism, uh, which is sleepwalking. Only instead of walking around at night, the patient's entire soul and their head departed from the body. Uncured, this curse has the potential to tear a family apart, particularly due to its violent nature. A treatment for the curse of the Rukarubi or the Nikarubi have been long sought after. Now, particularly because these women can often pass their curse on to their daughters, who show no sign until they start to mature. Afflicted girls are sold off. Or they used to be sold off. I don't know about today. Maybe they still do. 
Anyway, they were sold off to brothels or to human circuses, or they were forced to commit suicide in order to preserve their family's honor. A famous account from the Fukui Prefecture tells of a young woman afflicted with the curse of Nukarubi. Her head flew about the capital city at night, chasing young men through the streets. If the man was lucky, he might find a sanctuary behind a locked door. Unable to open the door, the head would scratch and bite at the wood barrier during the night, and they would leave deep grash gashes in the wood. Uh, when uh, the young girl eventually discovered that she was cursed, uh, she was so ashamed that she asked her husband for a divorce. She cut off all of her hair and uh, then committed suicide. She believed it was better to die than to live the rest of her life as a monster. According to lore from Hitachi, a man married a Nukarubi and heard from a peddler that the liver of a white-haired dog could remove the curse. He had such a dog, and he killed it, and he fed the liver to his wife. Sure enough, she was cured of the affliction. However, her curse was still passed on to their daughter, whose flying head took to biting white dogs to death. Other accounts said by removing the sleeping body to a safe place during the night, the head would not be able to return, and eventually it would die. However, this is not a cure that most families were willing to try, uh, since their daughter or wife would not survive it. Darn those Daleks. Dulahan are also known as headless horsemen. The legend of a decapitated horseman carrying his own head crops up in numerous European storytelling traditions. From the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight to the Brothers Grimm, headless horsemen abound. Hunting the highways and byways of remote locations and even occasionally riding rapidly through some town or city. The Dulahan, which uh, translates as the Dark Man, was a malevolent harbinger of death whose roots lie in Celtic mythology. Ah, sorry, Celtic mythology. He is said to be the embodiment of Krom Duba, a fertility god who demanded blood sacrifices in the form of decapitation. His worship ended with the coming of Christianity to Ireland. Frustrated by the loss of his sacrifices, he still roams the roads calling the names of those doomed to die and carrying his head under one arm. The flesh of the face is decayed with a reference to the consistency of the flesh being akin to moldy cheese, coming up in a lot of stories. The Dullahan is described as being a banshee that travels around in a coach a bower, a silent coach, which is an immense black wagon carrying a coffin drawn by a bunch of headless horses. So you got a headless horseman with a bunch of headless horses as well. It will roll up to your door, and if you open the door, a pitcher of blood will be thrown in your face. Some things don't translate well, and once you've been splashed with blood, either you would fall over dead or you had a short time to live, depending on which translation you read. In Norway, the heads of suicide victims were cut off to make their ghosts unable to navigate around town. Not being able to see where they were going would hinder their abilities to roam about the earth. However, the stories from Norway somehow arrived in Ireland and they were transformed into the Dullahans, or they both came out with this idea at about the same time. Historians are baffled about that one. 
The process of beheading corpses to ensure their spirits didn't roam came up in the book Dracula, written by Bram Stoker, who was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1847. Stoker lived in Clantarf, and it is said some of the details in his novel may have been inspired by the practice of burying corpses who died from suicide with a stake through their hearts. The body was buried at a crossroad so that it couldn't find its way back home. The most famous Doolahan figure is the Headless Horseman, uh, featured in Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow in rural New York. The Headless Horseman came from an actual event concerning a Hessian soldier who was killed in battle when his head was taken off by a cannonball uh, during the American Revolution. The corpse of the headless Hessian was buried soon after his death at the old Dutch church in Sleepy Hollow, near the small village of Terrytown, New York. It was believed that the Hessian would arise at night in search of his head, and anyone who was ill-fated enough to come across his apparition was condemned to die. Washington Ir Irwin, keep wanting to call him Irvin. Washington Irving was an American citizen. His parents were from Cornwall, England. Irving wrote the famous story while traveling in England. Blemai, or Blemias, also known as Iwapanema, their name translates to chest eyes were an African tribe of headless men native to Libya and Ethiopia. Uh, they were described in ancient Roman history as beings who threatened Rome, Rome's e Egypt a few times in the 3rd century AD. An early reference to the Blemias occurred in Herodotus's Histories, where he called them the Akaphalia, which is Greek for without a head. In antiquity, the tribe known as the Blamias were said to be named after King Blamias. In various medieval sources, Blamias are said to be six, eight, or even twelve feet tall and three to four feet across at the shoulders. They're often reported to be cannibals as well. Mila, a Roman geographer from 43 AD, was the first to name the Blamaya of Africa as being headless with their face buried in their chest. Pliny the Elder in the Natural History reported the Blamaya tribe of North Africa as having no heads with their mouths and their eyes seated in their chests. Uh, Pliny said that the Blimai lived somewhere in Ethiopia or in Nubia. The golden-colored, headless tribe encountered by Alexander uh, stood over six feet tall, and they had beards that hung down to their knees. Alexander captured 30 of these headless beings and had them shipped back home so he could show the rest of the world what he had found. In 1211 A.D., an explorer named Fermus said he had found a tribe of men without heads who had their eyes and their mouths in their chests. They were living on an island in Ethiopia. He added that they were 12 feet tall. Hundred years later, Sir John Mandeville wrote he had seen this same tribe as well. By the late Middle Ages, world maps began to appear that showed these headless people uh, further east in Asia. The Andrea Bianco map from 1436 depicted people whose ominous qui non abent capitis, or all do not have heads, living in India. Other maps of the period, such as the Andreas Walsperger maps from 1448, continued to show these headless beings living in Ethiopia. 
The post-medieval map of Giel Guillame, Guillame, I was about to pronounce it as if it was Spanish, Guillame, which it's not, it's Italian, Guillame Le Tustu, Testu, that guy, that Italian dude, illustrated the headless and the dog-headed Sinophilia north beyond the Himalayan mountains. Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis depicted the Blime in South America near the coast of Brazil on his world map, which was published in 1513. Sir Walter Raleigh insisted that the Blimeus tribe were real. In 1595, he reported along the Koora River, there lived a nation of people whose heads appear not above their shoulders, which, though it may be thought a mere fable, yet for mine own part, I am resolved it is true, because every child in the province of Ayarima and Kanuari, uh, parts of South America today, affirm the same. They are called the Iwapanama. They are reported to have their eyes on their shoulders and their mouths in the middle of their breasts, and that the long train of hair grows backwards between their shoulders. Raleigh reported that these Blimaeus lived in the same general area as the fabled city of Manoa, which the Spanish called El Dorado. Iwapatamas, Iwapatamas, were depicted on numerous later maps using Raleigh's account as a reference. Jadokus Hondius included them in his 1598 chart of Ghana and in a map of North America that was released the same year. A lot of the folks will say that these guys were all just superstitious people who thought there were monsters in unexplored lands. I wonder how could so many people all report the same basic structure uh, simply by imagining it? Many of these reports said that they had actually seen these beings. Could there have been a tribe living in Africa, India, and South America that had no heads, ate people, and either died off over the years or they went into hiding? Edinburgh Castle stands 445 feet above sea level, and it sits on top of Castle Rock. Castle Rock is one of three extinct volcanoes in Scotland's capital, the other two being Arthur's Seat and Calton Hill. Archaeologists believe there have been fortified buildings here for about 3,000 years. The, the Celts made their home there as far back as 600 CE. And the Celtic tribe built Edine's Hill Fort, on top of Castle Rock. The Votadini people were spread over an area that ranged from the Firth of Forth, the Fifth of Fifth, the Firth of Forth, to the northeast of England. The capital of Votadini territory was believed to have been the hill fort of Traprion Law, about 23 miles east of Edinburgh. Construction of Edinburgh Castle began around the 11th century with the building of St. Margaret's Chapel, the oldest surviving building in Edinburgh. Over the centuries, the castle has been improved and strengthened by the addition of other structures, uh, such as St. David's Tower, which was destroyed and then replaced by the Half Moon Battery. Uh, the Great Hall that dates back to 1511, and the Porticulus Gate. On November 24, 1440, the 15-year-old Earl of Douglas and his brother David were invited to have dinner at Edinburgh Castle by William Crichton. Crichton, sorry, not Crichton. Crichton. After the feast began, a bull's head was placed in the center of the table, and the young brothers were received by Crichton's men, accused of treason and executed, uh, followed by having their heads displayed on Castle Hill. 
The castle is believed to have been the most besieged building in Britain. The headless drummer boy of Edinburgh Castle is feared by anyone who sees or hears him. The sound of his drum was first heard in 1650 by a sentry posted on the walls. The guard was disturbed to hear drumming coming from the central courtyard of the castle. He stopped what he was doing and went to investigate the source of this sound. He spotted a young boy in a uniform walking in a circle around the courtyard beating on a drum. This was nothing he'd seen before, so the man went down to find out who this boy was and why he was making so much noise. It was late at night, and visibility was bad. The guard walked to the courtyard, and he approached the boy. As he got closer, he could see that this boy had no head. I don't know about back then, but I was taught the three general orders in basic. Number three being, I will report violations of my special orders, emergencies, and anything not covered in my instructions to the commander of the relief. In other words, don't wing it. Go get somebody else to make the decisions. A drummer boy with no head was probably not covered by his special orders, so the guard ran to get his commander. Colonel Dundas heard the report and probably thought this guy was nuts, drunk, or seeing things. Well, the guard wound up in the guard house, better known as the jail. As the nights went by, others began reported, reporting hearing somebody beating a drum in the courtyard. The first few reports said it lasted a few minutes. Then it was a few hours. Finally, the drumming went on until the sun was just peeking over the horizon. So many people heard the sounds and a few saw a boy walking around in uniform, the guard was eventually released. Not only did other guards see, but those working in the castle, and finally the colonel himself heard the drumming. Dundas reported that the drum beat a staccato rhythm similar to that of a marching English force. On running to the battlements expecting to see an English army approaching, he was somewhat relieved but extremely puzzled to not see anyone on the other side of the wall. The only way to convey orders to thousands of men on a battlefield was by having drummers who could play a variety of beats which would inform the soldiers what was expected of them. March, attack, retreat, stand to, etc. This job was almost always performed by young, as in from seven years old and up, usually orphaned children of soldiers who had died in battle. Who the drummer boy in the courtyard was, no one knew, but he was sounding the alarm. Oliver Cromwell's army soon appeared outside the castle, and it fell within a few days. He has not been seen since, but people have heard faint drumming in the dead of night that's been associated with the headless drummer boy. Legend states if his headless apparition is seen once more, ill luck is to befall the castle. The sound of his drum is believed to warn residents of an impending attack. I know this is cliché, but kids today have it easy. Until the late 1800s, children were used in all kinds of dangerous manner. A powder monkey was a young boy who would run back and forth delivering gunpowder on a ship during battle. The enemy sharpshooters would target these boys so that the cannoneers would run out of gunpowder. It was dangerous, and it needed a small body. Children were used. One of the oldest ghost stories in Edinburgh is that of the Phantom Piper. A few hundred years ago, work was being done on the castle. 
A wall in one of the lower sections was knocked down, and behind it they discovered a tunnel. Nobody knew this tunnel was even there, let alone where it might lead. There were new blueprints uh, showing where anything was in the castle. The So many changes had been made over the years. Structures had been built, rebuilt, renovated, conquered, abandoned, reoccupied. So it got to a point where this tunnel could possibly lead anywhere. If it came out outside the castle in one of the buildings below, or even at the bottom of the mountain, an enemy force could find it and sneak into the walls, leading to the fall once more. The walls of the tunnel were said to be smooth, nothing like what the local workers might have done. The men looking into the darkness thought that this must have been done by magic. Fairies must have built this tunnel. We're not talking about Tinkerbell here. We're talking about small creatures that didn't much care for humans. Uh, fairies were supposed to do all kinds of bad things to us human folk, and they had the magical ability to get away with it. Who could they send to have a look? A small boy who could play the bagpipes was voluntold that he was going to go. The idea was this young kid would walk along the tunnel, stopping every so often to play a few notes on the pipes. People above ground would be able to follow the sound, thus finding out where the tunnel opened up to the outside. The boy was handed a torch, his bagpipes, and bid a fond adieu. He walked along the pitch-black tunnel, stopping whenever he thought was the right time, and playing the pipes. People could hear the sound coming up from the ground, and a mark was made to show where the boy had stopped. They moved along the streets, making fairly good progress. The sounds were leading downhill, following the Royal Mile towards Holyrood Palace. The Royal Mile is a succession of streets forming the main thoroughfare of the town of Edinburgh. As the day wore on, the tunnel was mapped to several hundred yards from the castle to Tron Kirk. The men following the sounds realized it had been a long time since the last notes had been heard. There was no way of communicating back down into the tunnels, and no amount of yelling seemed to bring about a response. As the sun was setting, the mapping mission was brought to a halt. The entrance to the tunnel was still the only way to get underground, and the boy should come back that way if he couldn't go any further. He didn't show up that night or the next day. After waiting several days, it was decided that instead of trying again, using another voluntold, the entrance would simply be bricked shut. As for the boy, he was written off as uh, being lost. No one was willing to try a rescue attempt. If the fairies had him, there was no way to save him anyway. Uh, best just not to think about it. Years went by, and people continued to hear the sound of bagpipes being played from under the streets. It was faint, and those who heard it had no idea what it might be. When the stories eventually reached the castle, everybody agreed the boy couldn't possibly be still walking around down there, following the tunnels. It must be his ghost looking for a way out. To this day, people report hearing bagpipe sounds coming from below their feet. The notes begin up near the castle walls and they end in the area around the Tron. During the Napoleonic War, French prisoners were held in the castle. Most were never released. Over the years, people have heard the sounds of men speaking in French in the lower parts of the castle. A few have seen men in ragged French uniforms walking along on a few of the corridors. 
Back in the time before John Crap invented the flush toilet, poo stayed where it landed. Add to this people aversion to bathing and hundreds of people being crammed into substandard housing, you would get a mixture of smells that would cause a hyena to gag. Edinburgh was also known as Old Reiki, Old Smoky, because the coal-fired stoves found throughout the city and all the, the witches that were burned at the stake uh, caused the air to be filled with smoke. Two thousand Scots, mostly women, were burned as witches at Castle Hill between 1479 and 1722, when Edinburgh was the witch-burning capital of Europe. What a distinction that must have been. Yeah, we've killed more witches here than any other city in the entire planet. Uh, King James V of Scotland hated the Douglas family, and under his orders, Janet Douglas Lyon was known, who was known as the La Lady Glamis, uh, was falsely accused of witchcraft and plotting to poison the king. So uh, she was burned at the stake outside of Edinburgh Castle in 1537. Her ghost is seen all over the castle. She is called the Grey Lady. People report encountering her all over the castle, as well as in Glamis Castle, where she had lived before being arrested. She not only she is not the only ghost seen in Glamis, there are supposed to be well over a dozen. Uh, Thomas Lyon Bowes was born october twenty first, eighteen twenty one as the heir to one of the noble families of Scotland. He was the first-born child of the 11th Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn. The official record says he died within days of his birth. If you visit the graveyard, you won't find a tombstone. The unofficial story says he didn't die, but was locked inside a secret room to keep his image out of public view. Thomas was described as having a huge head, a barrel chest that was covered in long stringy hair. He had very short spindly legs and arms, not quite the royal figure that would inspire the town folk. The child was locked away to keep the family secret intact, like sloth in the Goonies. Being the firstborn son, you just can't go and kill him. What would the neighbors think? Thomas somehow managed to survive years as a prisoner in his own home. People working or visiting the castle would hear strange sounds coming from the lower parts of the building. A quick explanation as to it was animals or it was work being done, well, it didn't really cover things up. A quick explanation just didn't seem to work. On occasion, he did either escape or he was allowed out to either visit the chapel or to walk around the grounds. Not having told anyone, there was nobody around to keep an eye on him. The Earl his wife, and the castle manager were the only ones who knew that there was a family member being hidden away in the castle. If one of them wasn't right there keeping an eye on the boy, he could wander around and run into people. Staff members would encounter what they thought was a monster with the body of a hairy toad walking around the grounds. Everyone was told to keep their mouths shut or else. One man who encountered Thomas was given some money and a one-way one ticket to Australia. Thomas soon became known as the Monster of Glamis. The estate papers and architectural plans of Glamis Castle reveal there's a small space adjacent to the charter room in the base of the main tower. A castles weren't laid out like modern houses. Rooms were added on at random locations, 
When something bad happened, the rooms were walled off. Tunnels could be built, then bricked up and forgotten about. Try as they might, the secret still got out on occasion. In the early 1900s, people would visit the castle, hoping to find either the secret room or evidence of Thomas having been there. Eventually, one of the descendants of the royal family did admit that Thomas was indeed deformed, just as he had been described. It is said that in the dark of night, noises can still be heard from somewhere deep in the castle. Renovations to the castle have revealed skeletons in walled-up chambers. And even today, people report feeling an uneasy presence in certain rooms. Several visitors to the castle have said that they saw what looked like a huge, deformed shadow moving about in parts of the castle at night. Noises are still heard coming from the lower parts around where the secret room might still be hidden. Mary D. Geis, who in a strange coincidence came to Edinburgh the year after Janet the Grey Lady had been murdered, Mary was there to marry the man who'd executed Janet, King James V. Mary is best known as the mother of Mary, Queen of Scots, and acted as Queen Regent on behalf of her daughter from 1554 until her death six years later. She was a staunch Catholic and at the odds with the growing influence of the Scottish Protestants. Upon her death, her body was held in St. Margaret's Chapel, wrapped in lead, for several months before an agreement could be reached with the Protestant nobles to allow her body to be returned to France. Even having her body shipped away, the ghost of Mary is seen watering around Edinburgh Castle. She is also seen wearing a gray dress. Witnesses say there is a slight difference between the two gray ladies. One is taller than the other one, and uh, the shorter one is a bit heavier. St. John's College Library is thought to be haunted by the headless ghost of Archbishop William Loud, who was beheaded in 1645 following impeachment by the Parliament. The ghost of Archbishop William has been known to disturb readers in the library, by kicking his head along the floor. Sounds like the kind of thing I would do if I was a headless ghost. Uh, from 60 years ago up until today, readers say that they've heard the sound of footsteps advancing and retreating along the floor of the long reading room, which was built by Loud in the 17th century. It is known as the Laudian Library. These sounds have never been explained by anything such as possible heating causing the pipes to expand or contract. It's not the building settling. They know that these are footsteps going back and forth. The deputy librarian said, we don't know what loud carry... <laughs> Try that one more time. We do know that Loud cared passionately about his library, and we think he has a friendly presence here. I guess he's stopped kicking his head up and down the, the room. The River Severn winds through the whole of Shropshire like a snake. Anytime I hear stories coming from Shropshire, it reminds me of a Daffy Duck episode with the Shropshire Slasher. There are ghost cars and ghost ships, ghost planes and ghost trains. Why these inanimate objects come back as ghosts is beyond me. The ghost barge of the River Severn is just one more example of us not understanding the afterlife. The phantom barge is a frequent apparition and almost all reports suggest a full, solid object. It first appears heading towards the Iron Bridge, and it looks like a long, dark ship. 
not much different from barges that used to make their way up and down the Severn transporting goods. Before there were trains running all over the place, barges were used to transport everything from people to produce. At the boat's helm, people report seeing a tall, dark figure, often described as wearing old-fashioned type clothing or a dark cloak. He pilots the boat down the river. If you look closely at the barge, you can make out its cargo. Piled up high along the gunwales are corpses. Hundreds of them, all piled one atop the next, en route to some burial site. People report feeling a extreme feeling of sadness come over them whenever they see this vessel plying the water. They say that they feel as if their emotions are being drugged down to the bottom of a pit. The barge has also been seen two miles down river from the bridge near Jackfield with its anchor set at the bottom of the river. The bargeman is seen just standing there looking into the water. What looks to be the bodies are seen lined up along the banks, waiting to be collected by unseen workers. This haunting dates back to the 1660s plague. The Black Plague didn't just come and go. It would pop, pop up several times over the centuries. The Justinian Plague was from 541 to 544. The Black Death of Europe ran from 1347 to 1352, and the Great Plague of London was 1665 to 1666. The Plague of the 1660s ripped through the country with a disastrous effect for the communities. The symptoms begin with a fever or a chill. They culminate with nausea, headaches, delirium, and painful pus-filled buboes, thus the name bubonic plague, which, if these buboes did burst, would give a 50-50 chance of surviving. Though records are incomplete, it is a fair estimate to suggest that Shropshire lost about 15 to 20 percent of its population in an 18-month period. That is a monumental amount of people lost in such a tragic way. It is believed the ghost barge of the River Severn is a plague ship, transporting bodies on their final journey. Until the advent of rail, the Severn was the main source of transport throughout Shropshire. During the time of the plague, boats took the river full of the dead, transporting them to plague pits in an attempt to stop the spread of the disease. What the folks back then didn't realize was the plague wasn't being spread from person to person. It was carried by fleas, the Yersinia pestis, which thrives on black Asian rats. Once the rat is no longer a decent home for these fleas, they uh, take up residence on anybody close by. So you get the Black Plague from fleas. A jack field was one of the locations for several plague pits. Uh, so such a vessel would have followed this route. Unless immune or the rats had already abandoned the bodies, uh, taking the fleas with them, the barge man would often succumb to the plague. One can only imagine the psychological effect of such a job, especially in small communities. Conceivably, those who worked on these floating body piles would have been transporting friends, neighbors, and even loved ones to their final resting place. The surviving bargemen would have carried the ghosts of the dead with them until the end of their lives. The ghost of a plague barge is still journeying down the river. Is it the ghost of the barge that people are seeing, or is it a recording of its passing? Is the barge a ghost, or is the land and the water holding on to this terrible memory? 
The origins of the headless mule legend can be traced back to rural Brazil, where folklore thrives among many of the locals. The tale varies in different regions of the country, but the core narrative remains consistent. The legend revolves around a beautiful woman who was involved in sinful relationship with a priest, or possibly a lot of the local men. As a result of her transgressions, she was cursed by a powerful entity, doomed to roam the night as a headless mule. According to one version of the legend, the cursed woman is transformed into a monstrous creature every Thursday night. As she gallops through the countryside, leaving a trail of fire and destruction in her wake. Her fiery breath is said to be so intense that it burns crops and kills livestock. The headless mule's gruesome appearance is described as a massive, jet-black mule with glowing red eyes. Flames are spewing from its neck stump. Where the eyes set, that's beyond me, unless the eyes are just stationary above the neck where the head should be. I've never seen the headless mule, so I don't know. Any of my listeners down there in Brazil, if you could send me a quick note and let me know how the red eyes are associated with the mule, that would be a good thing. Like many folk legends, the headless mule has undergone variations as it spread across different regions of Brazil. In some versions, the mule is said to be a possessed or a cursed woman, rather than a woman who is transformed. In others, the transformation is only temporary, occurring for a limited period or triggered by specific conditions. In the state of Minas Gerais, for example, the legend takes on a unique twist. The cursed woman is said to transform into the headless mule on nights of the full moon, like a were-mule, a braying mournfully as she roams the countryside. In this variation, the curse can be broken if somebody manages to place a blessed rosary around the creature's neck, which would be quite a trick since the neck is spewing fire. The headless mule legend continues to captivate the imagination of people in Brazil, inspiring artists and cultural expressions. The tale has been adopted into literature, theater, and even some movies. Uh, makes people sit up and pay attention. These adaptions often explore the psychological and emotional torment endured by the cursed woman, uh, providing a deeper understanding of her plot. Plight, not plot. In recent years, the legend has also become a prominent part of Brazil's folklore tourism industry. Locals and tourists alike seek out places associated with the legend, such as crossroads, old churches, remote paths, uh, hoping to catch a glimpse of the headless creature or have an experience of the supernatural kind. That's uh, what a lot of people like to do, kind of like folks that go on ghost hunts, except they're going on headless mule hunts. San Ignacio, Texas was first established in 1830. There is a fortified ranch house that the folks like to refer to as the fort. The story of El Muerto, the headless horseman of Texas, starts out up in the, the west of San Antonio. A band of bandits were captured and hung by two Texas rangers and a ranch owner. At the time, anybody declared to be an outlaw had already been sentenced. All that had to do was the law had to catch the person and uh, fulfill the execution. The bandit Vidal was just running around waiting for someone to catch him and carry out the execution order. Once the sentence had been fulfilled, the rangers tied Vidal to his horse minus his head, 
which was tied with a rope hanging from the saddle horn. The idea was this would send a message to the other outlaws that Texas was not the place to be. The headless body moved south, always leaving a trail of fear and disbelief in his wake. When the headless rider was spotted near Ben Bolt, which is just south of Alice, Texas, ranchers managed to lasso the horse, and they relieved it of its burden. The body was filled with bullet holes and arrows. People would shoot at this thing as they saw it going by, wondering why none of these rounds did any good. Well, the body was buried in an unmarked grave, and the horse was set free to go on about his life minus one dead body. For years after the body of Vidal was in the ground, the headless horseman continued to ride across the countryside. People reported seeing it all over the southern counties of Texas. Late at night, the people living in San Ignacio would hear all the dogs in town begin barking and growling and then whimpering. This riot would continue up until they heard the sounds of hoofbeats passing through the town. As the sound of a fast-moving rider would pass out of town, the dogs all grew quiet. The following day, people would tell about having been chased by the headless horseman. El Muerto had ridden into town and drove anybody outside into hiding. The spirit of El Muerto is still seen from time to time. Most of the reports are of a fast-moving rider who would pass in the night. Those unlucky enough to see him all said that he had no head. Just a body on a horse. Westlaco, Texas is just east of McAllen. Back in the 1990s, a headless horseman was seen there once again. The witness was 13 or 14 years old at the time. Her and a bunch of friends and cousins were playing hide-and-seek. It was her turn to do the looking, so she closed her eyes and she counted really loud so that the others would know when she was on her way. Once she was ready, she began her search around the front of the house. Not seeing anyone, she walked towards the back to see who might be hidden there. As she rounded the house, she spotted a man on a horse riding by through the field behind their house. This rider had no head. This scared her so bad that she ran for the door, yelling that she was no longer playing hide-and-seek. It was just getting too weird out there. It took a while, but the others slowly began to filter back inside. They were all wondering why she had quit playing. When she tried to explain what she had seen, the others thought that she was just making excuses for not being able to find any of them. Her older brother came slinking in with a look of fear on his face. He said that he'd seen the headless horseman riding through the field out back. He had seen the horseman about a half hour after his sister had seen it. Also from San Ignacio, Texas. Back in 2018, I was at the Edinburgh UFO Festival. I was given a vendor's table right next to Travis Walton. I managed to talk to Travis many times during the slow times. A man came up and he bought one of my books, the Laredo Paranormal Research Society. He said he wanted to buy it for his sister. Then we began talking and he told me about his grandfather's ghost sighting from back in the 40s. Somebody came to my table, and they asked me a question, and before I could get back to the, the man telling the ghost story, he waved and walked away. The next week, I was doing my podcast, and I announced that I wanted the man with the ghost story to contact me. I wanted to know how the story ended. My wife is a schoolteacher. She was approached at work by one of the other teachers who asked if just maybe she was somehow related to the writer of the book that she had just gotten from her brother. 
the book was the Laredo Paranormal Research Society. Angie is Joe's sister, the guy from Edinburgh, who had started telling me the ghost story but never was able to finish it. We wound up having dinner with Angie and her parents. They told us a lot of stories from San Ignacio, from Fort Ringgold, and from Laredo. Joe Solis was the man telling me the story about his grandfather, and here it is. Back in the 1940s, people living in San Ignacio did not have indoor plumbing. If you needed the facilities, you had to walk out back and uh, use that little building in the far corner of the yard. You put the outhouse as far from the main house as you could because in the summertime, a hot outhouse can have quite a smell to it. At night, it was necessary to use a kerosene lantern in order to find the outhouse. It was way in the backyard past the corrals and the pigeon coop. The grandfather would tell the family that there was a headless ghost that would follow him as he went out to the outhouse or as he was returning. The ghost would come from the corrals. He was not so much scared as tired of seeing this specter that had been going on for so long, he'd kind of gotten used to it. The family all figured that the old guy was just imagining things. It was dark, and using a latrine outside could create some scary shadows. Uh, maybe he was just imagining things. After years of hearing about the headless ghost, the family mostly ignored it. The grandfather died in 1959. In 1997, or maybe 99, a fence was being built along the area where the corrals and the pigeon coops used to sit. The workers were digging fence posts when they found bones buried in the backyard. Human bones. The crew unearthed an old yellowed skeleton that was missing its head. A search of the records in town did not produce any information on who had been buried in the yard. It was assumed that the body had been that of an Indian who had died and was buried before the house was even there. His head was never found. A San Ignacio is an old town and has lots of history. On the corner of Uribe and Gutierrez streets is the 19th century fortified complex known as the Trevino Uribe Ranch. Uh, folks call that the fort. It was built on a bluff overlooking the Rio Grande River in the 1830s. As time went by, the fort became known as Fort Trevino. It was actually just a fortified ranch house used to defend the rancher and his family during bandit raids from Mexico. The entire fort is 100 feet by 140 feet. It was built using hand-cut sandstone blocks, and it has a wooden roof. The community was slated for destruction in the name of progress. But once the Falcon Dam was put in back in 1951, the town was saved. Joe's sister and his parents told me these next few stories. I put Angie down as the person talking since I didn't write down who was speaking during each part of the telling. As I was reading my notes, I realized that my notes were missing some info. This happens a lot when I'm trying to write and listen to somebody talk at the same time. Things get missed. The same grandfather from the Headless Ghost story had told about when he was young, he used to be harassed by a little girl in a white dress. She wasn't any ordinary little girl because she moved about as if being able to appear and disappear at will. He would be out playing in the yard. This meant the entire area around the house. If he needed to go back into the house, he would walk to the back gate. The little girl would appear and block his entrance. Not wanting to deal with this supernatural being, he would run to the front gate, only to run into her there as well. 
She didn't run to the front gate. She just would appear there all of a sudden. Makes me wonder if this is the same little girl seen all over Laredo, or does San Ignacio have their own creepy little girl running around? The townsfolk all avoid the area west of the house. There was a huge black dog that nobody knew who owned it or where it had come from, but it would stand there growling, and it made all the people in town very uncomfortable. The old fort had a hitching post out front for tying up horses. A four-year-old girl told her folks she didn't want to go near the corrals because there was a man sitting on a horse. He had glowing red eyes, and this scared her. Angie told me that she didn't like to stand on the ground in the plaza. There were picnic tables and benches that you could sit on, but the ground felt wrong. It would cause her entire body to shake. She would ride her bike through the area, or she could sit on one of the benches or one of the tables without any problem. Once her feet touched the dirt, things got weird. She felt as if she were being watched by unseen strangers. The house they lived in was an old cabin on blocks and half Try that again. The house they lived in was an old cabin a block and a half from the fort that had been added to over the years. As generations would come and go, rooms would be built or torn down or replaced or relocated. This caused the house to kind of move about the property over the years. At night, they could hear somebody walking along the wooden floor of the hallway. On occasion, they would hear dishes crashing to the floor in the dining room. In the morning, the dining room would be undisturbed. Nothing was out of place. On occasion, the doors to the rooms would be held shut by some unknown entity. I've heard about these from others who have said that this has happened to them in various locations. A door that opens and closes easily suddenly won't open, trapping the person in the room. This has been reported on many ghost investigations all over the country. One night, Angie said it sounded as if someone was beating the front door down. They saw someone looking in through the windows. By morning, everything was back to normal. There was no sign that anyone had been pounding on the outside of the door. Angie grew up and she became a mu music teacher. She was hired as the assistant band director in Rio Grande City, which is about 70 miles south of her home. Rio Grande City High School is located at the old Fort Ringgold. Well, it used to be there. I, I don't know if it still is or not. Many of the buildings are from back when it was an active military fort. I have several other stories from Angie, but uh, I'm not going to get into them here. If you want to hear all of her interesting stories, check out Paranormal Stories and you'll find her stories. The actual name is San Felipe del Rio, shortened to del Rio, which means from or of the river. There is a creek called San Felipe Creek where a headless ghost is said to hang out. The story begins back in the beginning of the settlements in the area, perhaps 1831. A Settlement was established in the San Felipe Creek, and the men and the women tried to make the best of things. Indians continued to raid the area, and it is said that one woman was beheaded during an attack. The Indian took the head as a war trophy and rode away, leaving the body behind. There are legends of a headless corpse roaming their places of death in search of missing parts. People report seeing a woman's body walking along the banks of the San Felipe Creek as if she's looking for her head. As she passes any house, they say that the dishes will rattle and dance about, caused by her movement. So there, I hope I scared you into not sleeping tonight. 
Well, at least I hope you enjoyed the stories. If you did, you know what to do. Tell people. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Tell your enemies that they should be listening to Strange Things with Chris James. After all, Annabelle Lee says you should be listening to Strange Things. And if you get a chance, check out Trailer Trash Terrors as well, and you'll find out more about this creepy little girl. Until next week, this is Chris James for Strange Things.